250 kilometers of double-walled razor wire, flanking a dedicated electric fence. South African National Defense Force patrols. This is the South Africa-Zimbabwe frontier. The fence, erected by South African authorities, is designed to keep out illegal Zimbabwean migrants. Political activists, escaping persecution by President Robert Mugabe's regime, or simply refugees, driven by desperation, unemployment and starvation, breach the fence daily. In the process, men and women of all ages, as well as unaccompanied children, risk their lives and fall prey to bandits known as Guma Guma. Running this gauntlet, desperate for a new way of life, the refugees are systematically robbed, raped and brutalized by these Guma Guma, who often pose as guides. This is one of five shelters for rape survivors run by Medicines Sans Frontiers in the South African border town of Musina. When they cross the border through the river, they meet uh, unknown men and women who are called Gumagumas. They rob them of their money and rape them in order for them to gain access and entry into South Africa. Some of the women are being raped up to five men raping one woman, and others are raped in front of their children. Others are forced to have sex with relatives. They're like a mother and a son crossing the border, they are forced to have sex, and the unknown men will be armed. So because of fear of death, they are forced to do it, and the ratio is 50-50, male and females. The brutality and humiliation meted out by the so-called Guma Guma is systematic. Men are also victimized. Yeah, they get raped as well, and others are sodomized. The origins of Zimbabwean society as we know it today can be traced back to the arrival of the pioneering British colonizers, led by empire builder Cecil John Rhodes in 1889. A ruthless industrialist, Rhodes secured by deceit a mining concession from King Lobengula, the Indebeli ruler who claimed dominion over most of the territory between the Limpopo and the Zimbezi rivers at the time. Rhodes used this concession to secure a royal charter from the British Crown. This enabled Rhodes to establish a settler state in Mashonaland, ruled by his British South Africa company. In 1893, the settlers waged war on King Lobengula. Lobengula's forces were defeated and Gobulawayo, the Indebeli capital, was sacked. Victorious, the settlers carved the defeated kingdom into farms and mines. The Indebeli national herd was seized and distributed as war booty. On the ruins of Lobengula's kraal, the town of Bulawayo was built. In the process, the foundations of the last outpost of the British Empire, Rhodesia, were laid. It was the age of empire, when Britain ruled supreme. It was also the era of the horse. In the colonies, troops were mobilized on horseback. Transport was by grace of the horse. As with cricket, Thoroughbred horse racing was an integral part of British life in the colonies. I think we all grew up with the idea that excellence resided in Britain. So therefore, excellence was our British identity rather than our African identity. To this day, I have this huge respect for things British because it was drummed into me as a child. It's a sort of insidious process of the values that you imbibe. And if you look at Mugabe today, he grew up in a very imperialist institution, the Catholic Church, from a tiny little boy. His father basically abandoned the family when he was 10 years old. And his surrogate father, who was an Anglo-Irish priest, Father O'Hay. And so, in addition to this uh, colonial idea that 
all things British were by definition superior. Here was Robert Mugabe, this young, impressionable, very sensitive child, very shy child, didn't uh, deal well with other kids, who imbibed, in addition, the values of a white and rather wealthy, partly British surrogate father. One of the very obvious aspects of Mugabe's Britishness is this very characteristic stiff upper lip approach. When he went to prison, he manifested a lot of aspects of that Britishness. He got six of his seven degrees while he was in prison for only 11 years, which tells you how much time he spent with his nose in a book in this sort of isolated kind of way, rather than talking to people as, for example, Mandela did. When he came out of prison, he was interviewed by various people and he insisted that he was not bitter. And he referred to his time in prison as having been a power strategy. But his only child died while he was in prison and he furthermore wasn't allowed to attend the burial.